Hello, fellow Sublime Text fanatics. Odan Nerd here. Welcome to tonight's live stream for uh, November the 17th. Really great with dates. Apologies for missing last week's stream, but I've been having some rather extreme headaches of late, which I think are, are I now know anyway, are likely related to eye strain. Hang on a second. I got to take this bracelet off. So it doesn't make annoying scratchy noises. Um, so I passed on last week's stream on Tuesday because I had like a bad headache back in, you know, this area here. And just even looking at the brightness of a dark screen was making it worse. And we didn't do it on the following day because that was a Remembrance Day here in Canada or I believe a Veterans Day if you're in the U.S., which is a holiday. Uh, and then the next day after that, I went to see uh, an eye specialist and got my eyes checked. And everything is uh, looking as good in there as can be expected, given a man of my advanced age. So the general consensus is these glasses are pretty old. Should probably get myself some some new ones. So I've been trying to uh, take it easy with the uh, tiny writing, uh, reading and such. And uh, until I can uh, get in and get uh, my eyes tested and pick up some new glasses, which is kind of tricky in these uh, these COVID times. But in any case, we are here and uh, live this week and uh, ready to jump into some potential plug-in uh, related stuff. I had an idea for stuff I wanted to work with. And just before uh, the stream started, just now I've been talking with someone uh, in the uh, in the Discord, and it reminded me of something that I had done previously, and I thought I would take a look at that first, maybe, and see just a little bit about what was going on uh, with that particular thing, and more on that in just a moment. But I think we are probably uh, good to go at uh, this juncture, and then we'll get into uh, the thing that I was thinking of doing originally. Let's go ahead and do a little bit of that, and away we go. <laughs> Hello, fellow Sublime Text fanatics. Odin Nerd here. Once again, welcome to tonight's live stream. And if you missed the introduction, there wasn't a live stream last week because I was having a, a pretty bad headache, uh, the kind where you're sensitive to light. So even looking at a, a dark screen in a darkened room uh, was really setting things off. And uh, we didn't do it uh, that night for that reason. Didn't uh, do it the following night because that was a holiday. And then the next day after that, I went to see an eye specialist, which is actually an appointment that I had previously scheduled. It wasn't something that was uh, as a result of this uh, because uh, just, you know, regular uh, eye care for an advanced person of my age. Eyes checked out fine. So uh, presumably my issue is I've been reading too much uh, small print and my glasses are kind of old. So um as a result of that, I'm getting some eye strain and it's causing some headaches. So I've been taking it easy on that. We are ready to roll into tonight's live stream here. And um, additional to that, if you follow on the other channel, uh, you will have noticed uh, in this uh, last week's video that there was an update of what's going to be happening uh, on that channel and on this channel for the remainder of the year, realistically. Um, and we'll see what uh, how the schedule will change and what the new year brings. Um, so the first bit of that is apologies to anybody who's uh, a subscriber of the channel and was surprised to see a second channel update so soon after the 1,000 subscriber special. I try not to do those super often because you're probably coming to the channel to learn about Sublime, not to see me talking in a chair. But uh, the one for Monday was actually scheduled to be that, and I've been planning on doing that one for some time because there's uh, so many Mondays in November. Um, and basically, uh, I did the other one because, hey, a thousand subscribers, I didn't think that was going to happen. I didn't want to push that off for, you know, another month, realistically, I think is what it worked out to be, right? Yeah. So, but what we're going to be doing on that channel is only plugin 101 for December uh, because of Devember. And I announced my Devember project as well, which is working on my YouTube package. So as a result of that, that's why the other channel has been just primarily regular tutorials because we're going to do a flip on that. And then starting in uh, January, again, we'll start, you know, alternating between those two things as time warrants. And of course, we're in uh, new versions of Sublime Text. This is build 4092, which came out just uh, Sunday. As a matter of fact, it's got some new stuff uh, going on inside of it. <clears throat> and uh, when those builds become publicly available, if they do, we don't know when they're going to happen. As I said in the video, I have no internal uh, knowledge on when that might actually be. Um, we uh, 
we're probably just going to interrupt everything and just start dropping videos. Now, my plan is to have sort of an overview. Hey, this is sublime. This is what's new. This is what's different. And then um, I already have a lot of ideas for smaller targeted videos um, to for all of the questions that have been asked over the last year about migrating from Sublime 3 to Sublime 4 and all of the little bits of things that are different. And I'm going to try to put out a bunch of smaller videos for that, not necessarily on the same schedule because they normally only do once a week. And uh, we'll be doing live streams here on this channel for the month of December, uh, twice a week minimum, uh, assuming health stays kosher across the board. I can't promise you know, something terrible might not happen, but Tuesdays and Thursdays all through December, uh, live streams here, maybe two hours long, maybe only an hour working on the November project and still uh, answering questions. Um, and <clears throat> there will also be a daily video on days where there aren't live streams that recaps the November pros progress for that particular day. Live streams will count as their own devlog update. And uh, what's the last thing to say in that? Um, I think that's pretty much everything. So the plan that I had for this evening um, was to work a little bit on uh, generating PNGs from plugins wholly with Python code. Now, the idea that I had for my November project last year was a game in Sublime, um, and I was going to do it uh was it yeah the original the original November project that I had last year as an idea that I didn't do was making a roguelike type dungeon crawling game actually based on four against darkness uh, in sublime and to do that I was going to use regular text mode with a special font that had map squares on it to be able to render the screen um because I had looked into generating PNGs and it didn't seem like there was a particularly nice way to pull something like that off. Uh, decided that wasn't necessarily an easy way to go. So I went with the multiple project thing, one of which was the YouTube riser package, which is going to be this year's November project. But um, this year I was thinking of doing the same thing again. And I found a library that can conceivably do something like that. And I may have forgotten to swap up my uh, my lower third there. So we might need to repair that as well. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so I'm, we're going to play with that a little bit. Now, I guess we better just uh, check this out for the time being here. Because I don't remember what I actually put in there. Ah, good evening, Ashwin, or good morning for you. Ah. Uh, Stream lower thirds. Right on. All right. I was, uh, my pre stream uh, setup time was mostly dominated by talking to someone in DMs in the Discord. And as a result, I forgot to double check on something. Doop. This is this not, oh, right. Is this not the machine that this is running on? I would have thought it was. Oh, no, 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 no. Right, right, right. I forgot I swapped her out. Yeah, it's in this one. A peek behind the curtains, if you will. We're not creating a browsable command in this plugin. Some random plugin development. You know what? I'm going to say that actually qualifies. So that's fine. And, uh, Yes, this is uh, the magic of the uh, HTML that powers those lower thirds in the bottom of the window. Uh, some of the most complicated CSS stuff that I've ever done, I'm surprised that it actually works as well as it does. And if I stop looking at it for 10 minutes, I forget what it was actually supposed to be doing. Um, just a quick check here. Um, okay, so someone was asking in the discord in uh in a dm about modifying the output of build systems to remove some parts of the errors in there um i think python and java if i remember correctly i mean i could look but and uh is something like that possible and still display phantoms on the screen um and the answer to that technically is yes because if we were to look at the exec command the exec oops pardon me the exec command is of course the command that's responsible for executing 
any build that doesn't have a target key in it. So if you weren't using Terminus for something like this, then you could make your own custom target based on the exec command. And one of the things uh, it, that this does, of course, is it fires off the async process, which is actually the thing that is running in said external build. And this part sets it up. This is what actually executes it. And um, there are these two threads here for reading standard out and from for reading standard error. And they fire off threads that call this read file no method, which is down here. We can see it right there. And this takes the data incrementally, uh, decodes it into the encoding that is specified in the build, which defaults to UTF-8. Um, and the, this, this is an incremental decoder because the output of a program um, isn't necessarily line by line, it's character by character. So it's possible for this to read the first half of one of the lines of text that say the Python interpreter spits out or something like that. So if that happened and that split on the number of bytes coming in fell inside of like the middle of a multi-byte UTF, a regular decoder would fail or decode the wrong thing because, hey, this isn't a valid sequence. But I guess it would probably just fail. I, I assume that it's smart enough to not degrade the other way, right? Now that I think about it. Um, so it has to use an incremental decoder, which decodes as much as possible. Then this is the bit where we see it replacing sequences of carriage return new line with new line. And then after that, it replaces just carriage returns with new lines. This is the thing that um, modifies the content before it goes to the output panel to make sure that whether the program is generating Linux line ends, Mac OS line ends, or Windows line ends, it ends up being normalized to the slash n line end that is used all throughout Sublime. And then it triggers self on listener to give it the data. And you know, we also have to make sure that these threads finish themselves up. Pardon me. So um, one thing that this will point out is if you try to run one of those programs that writes a line of text with, say, 5% on the end, and then the next 10% happens and it wants to use slash R to, to go back to the start of the same line and output the line again, that won't work in a build system. You'll see it stacking up content because of this. The build output is not a terminal. So one thing that you could do, and I've actually done this in the past, is... Um, no, yeah, you're going to be like that, aren't you? If you were to subclass this or potentially make your own class based on it, you can tell when data is coming in. And here we can see it calling self right on the data. And I imagine this is different. The last time I did this was build 3189, I believe. Um, so here we can see it just immediately cramming stuff on. Imagine you had your own code inside of here that actually uh, massaged the data to change it before it gets sent to the panel. And what I've done in the past um, for LinkPad, um, which is a pretty awesome Windows tool if you do database stuff or C-sharp stuff for Windows. A uh, link pad is a great thing uh, to play with for something like that. I believe there's a free version. There's also enhanced versions. You can save scripts and run them with a command line process, say with some just arbitrary small lines of C-sharp. So you can use C-sharp for scripting. Those files have an XML header block at the start of them that describes the whole of the thing and how it's supposed to execute. And when it generates error messages, if there's something wrong, it tells you the error message in the actual file, which is always wrong by like 20 characters or something, depending on the size of that header, because the header isn't actually part of the code, right? So you would see there being weird errors. You run your script from Sublime, you get an error, you click to navigate, and you end up at the wrong spot in the file. Sorry, it goes the other way. It it generates errors as if the header wasn't there, but the header is there. So when it says there's an error on line 12, you click, you end up in the middle of a header and you don't know what the hell's going on. So I built a build system, a custom target that actually gathered the lines of text and swapped them out. So 
there was someone asking about that. And this is an interesting thing. I don't know. This has changed quite a bit. Like, for example, now we have annotations uh, in here as well. So the first thing it has to do is append the characters and then it checks. Oh, yeah, I guess as I think what this is doing is as output is going to the output panel, it would throw annotations up into the uh, thing. Um, so this is definitely something interesting and maybe something we can work on uh, for another night to see if we can come up with uh, another version of that. When I did this previously, I just copied the exec command directly uh, and then made modifications to it, but um, which I think I did specifically because it's safer that way than subclassing exec, which would in this particular case fail in this build because the exec command works so much differently. Um, but it's still an interesting uh, thing. So we'll probably work on something like that. That's not what we're working on for tonight though. What we're going to be playing with, and I have done the barest level of uh, modification for this or uh, testing for this I should say is seeing if we can generate some form of PNG file on the fly from a sublime plugin using only uh, Python code um, and the reason for that is if I'm going to use something uh, a library of some sort inside of a package I want to be able personally to vendor it inside of my package as opposed to making it a dependency uh, because managing dependencies is a pain in the butt. But if you had it vendored into your own package, then life is you know much better. You don't have to go to all that trouble. Plus, the idea that every package might have some sort of dependency the way dependencies exist as libraries, you can only ever have one version of them installed, right? So everything has is version locked to the same version of Google API client or whatever, if it's not vendored. So if I do use libraries, I want to have them vendored so that I'm not reliant on the fact that someone else decides they need a newer version of said dependency for some feature in their package, and they also update the dependency to the new version, and now my code is broken because it's expecting an older version version of the package and interfaces have changed in an incompatible way. I've spent too much time on the support end of things to want code to break out from underneath me. Um, and if I'm going to do something with a package inside of Sublime, I don't want it to have native code because that's a giant pain in the rump too. I don't want to be compiling code on any system for this, um, least alone trying to compile libraries for Windows or something. And what I came up with was this uh, package here, PyPNG. Now, is it a good library? I don't know. I haven't actually tested it, but it is purely written in Python, which is nice. Um, and additionally, when there are multiple ways to install it. You can install it as a normal module if you like, but you can also just pluck this file out of the, the uh, repository and drop it directly into your application. So this thing is like purpose built for what I want to do with it because I want to have this thing directly inside my own package. And sometimes that can be a pain if it's a package that has multiple um, things. And if they do relative imports of themselves, then you have to modify them to work inside of a package or play weird games, modifying the syspath, which nobody wants to get into. Even, you know, package control is getting away from that. So this seems like a uh, great way to do something like this. And we're really positioned, I think, to do something like this. And I think I mentioned in the introduction, not uh, there has been a point where I wanted to try making a game. I, I think as it was la yeah, it was last year that I did it, but the new builds came out close enough to November that I had already kind of settled on what it was I was going to try to do. Um, but I, we have investigated in the past the idea of a Python library for generating PNGs. Now, this thing is incredibly bare bones. It's literally you have to give it the color of every pixel. So it doesn't have any drawing primitives or anything like that. That's something that would have to be stacked on there for this to be wholly useful. But it seems like a fun thing to play with, right? 
Um, and as, as a basis for something like that, that's pretty cool. Now, you probably want native code if you want it to be performant, but we're just sort of playing around with stuff here. Um, but if I, at the time, I don't recall there being a good solution to that. Um, and a lot of that might have been that any libraries that do this wanted Python 3.5 or higher and Sublime 3 didn't have that support yet. So even if I did find this, I wouldn't have tried to use it because it wouldn't have worked anyway, I don't think. Um, but this requires, I think, at least Python uh, 3.5 at this point. So we're going to need a special package for this. We'll call it PNG test just to... I'm trying to move these pa this, these little explorations out of my user package because I got like 28 untracked files in there that I need to deal with. Uh, of course, I do have a ridiculous number of this loose packages laying around in my packages folder, but I pull down said file. That seems like it probably worked nicely. And we need a Python version setting this to 3.8 as well. And I'm going to imagine that it actually, yeah, look at that. It unloaded the plugin in 3.3 and loaded it in the other one. That's nice. That's, that is handy. Let's open the PNG test package. So we have something to play with in here. Um, so here's the uh, code for this thing. And I said, I, I looked through it a little bit. I haven't actually run any code through it at all. I just sort of looked to see um, what it might be doing. And it seems like it's got a, a lot of uh, action in here. And as I say, it, it does, as far as I can see, I mean, if we, uh, if we turn the mini map on, it's fairly long, but the number of classes that are in it well, that's not going to help, is it? Uh, there's like a reader class. Whoops. Hey, do that. There's a writer class um, and a couple of others. And that is like all there is in this. So uh, it's really just a very bare bones thing. Um, and Ashwin says, same story. My packages and user is also a mess, but procrastination being a thing. Yeah, if I was to like... This is the list of stuff in here that I've been, you know, fiddling with. Some of these are things I could actually add, like Python, or the uh, piano settings for the piano package could be part of this. Um, some of these are obviously just stuff that I threw in here temporarily. This one's a disabled version of something that's probably still in here. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff here I want to put in the scraps repository. Um, but... It is rough, and if we were to look at uh, a package report, the number whoops, the number of user or unpacked packages I have in here, pipe text, PNG text, I don't even know why I have purple haze installed, quick panel, I don't remember what that even is. It's an operation in and of itself to actually go through this thing and see what all of these packages even are. This is one that can probably go away. I'm not entirely sure I care about that one anymore. I did notice, um, interestingly, on Windows, the little checkbox in this is all color now. Right? Maybe it always has been for the uh, specifics of things in there. Um, let's go ahead and toggle that minimap off again. Cause I'm not a super fan of that particular operation. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I can print the package report now. In fact, I think that's one of the things I uh, I played with. I also added. Oh, that reminds me. I, I added this to my command palette, and I also added a key binding for uh, copy as HTML, so that I can grab some stuff and blop it in, um, which will be extra handy after uh, when Ben modifies that so that it puts the appropriate uh, mime type in the clipboard so that you could actually paste it in to stuff because uh, it's a nice way to share code with people in emails and stuff i wonder if that works in matter most but uh, will suggested that we create a an issue for adding printing support here because there's there's not a key bind to it 
which makes sense because the default key binding for printing is usually control P and that's already something. So I don't even know what you would put for that, but I think you would probably expect to find it in the command palette. Um, so maybe they have an idea for a key binding there. I'm not sure. Um, now, if we look at the documentation for this thing, uh, the first thing to play with is just getting it to generate any kind of PNG. And again, this doesn't have any raw drawing primitives in it, um, but I think it probably still handy-ish. Um, we can always, you could always just come up with something like that yourself. Um, was, there, was there, were the examples only in the web page? I guess they're only in the web page. Uh, not in this web page, I don't think, or maybe they are. No, 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 that's really stuff. Google code, blah, 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 blah. Um, was it up here and I scrolled past it to talk about that part? Yeah. Theoretically, something like this. Small, smiley, and s indeed. Um, well, let's give it a try and see what it actually does. So let's copy that. Um, and I actually have another tab over here with the actual documentation for this thing. Um, and uh, I'm using the dark mode thing for both of these things. It seems to work pretty well for when I want something to be a little dark here. Now, maybe if we jump to code examples. So the basic strategy is to create a writer object and then call its write method with an open binary file and the pixel data. And one thing I also played with is the idea of dumping that directly into um, a byte array, and then it could immediately be encoded into a data URI with code that we've already done in another live stream way back when and injected directly into a phantom or something. So you don't even have to generate stuff on disk, right? Um, but let's presume we probably want to see if we can actually get it to do anything at all before we get into something like that, right? Um, and I have multiple windows here, don't I? Yes, yes, I do. You do not need to be here, my friend. You can go away. Um, I investigated briefly whether my window manager can do the uh, the in-window, uh, the, the menu, like in the hamburger icon. Seems like uh, the next version that comes out, it's going to have that, so... Until then, uh, sadly not, though maybe I could change some of these colors too or, you know, press the appropriate key and just sort of hide that stuff away. Although it does tend to uh, come to the fore when you do something like that. So, uh, new file relative to current view and we'll call this sample because why not? Shift it over here. Um, let's say... File name equals, oh, uh, 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 import sublime plugin. Always make sure you have the good stuff in there. Um, and we're also probably going to want to def plugin loaded, right? Yeah, sublime dot package it. Oh. What's the magic of uh, format strings? Is it a little something like this? Can you do stuff in line? Like this? Cool. Maybe that's a nicer way to work this stuff out. Um, so we did sublime.packages path. Going to give us that, right? So if we wanted and that's going to need a slash and then PNG test and then ramp PNG. That's going to give us the name we like. It is. So let's say that's the file name. Then we don't even need to have a little variable here. Oh, but I used single double quotes instead of single quotes. Well, the world's going to come to an end. Oh, maybe I should fix that too. 
Hmm. Oh, you need to use a dot, don't you? Can you do a relative import like this? No, of course not. I guess you probably want something like that. Well, that seems to have done something. Look, there's a teeny tiny uh, thing there. From black to white. How is it even doing that? It's a grayscale image that is. Oh, I should probably have done that another way, shouldn't I? We want to be able to see this image while we're fiddling with stuff. And I imagine every time I save that, the that thing should totally. Uh, Does that do a thing? No, huh? I'm just I'm just playing with fire in this thing because I'm not entirely sure how that works. Let's let's take her back. Right on. Um. So we're <laughs> binary mode is important. Okay. Let's double check what this thing is actually doing. A width of 256 and a height of 1, and it is definitely grayscale. And then it has no alpha, the bit depth is 8, no palette, not transparent, no background, no gamma, no compression, no interlace. Doop, doop. So, oh, we got right here. Width in pixels as two separate arguments. Uh, size is a single argument, is a separate thing. So you probably don't care about that one. Pixels are grayscale, not RGB. I guess that changes why this is just giving it single things, right? Um, because my understanding for something like this, uh, for this thing from looking at it, is that you want to give it a list of lists, and each sublist is one line. So that's one line. That's one line. So this would be like two things. And then the values in this array are the RGB values. So you might say 255, 255, 255 to have a white pixel. And then you would immediately go, if you wanted to have a white pixel followed by uh, a black pixel, and then you could do the same thing for a second line or do it the other way. So that would look something like this, you know, if we have to modify our sample code. And this would be a two by two image of black, white, black, white, or white, black, black, white. So I'm imagining because this is set to grayscale, this is just one value from zero up to 255. Um, so let's see if we did that, if we did this by, let's say, 256, probably this gets mad, I would think. Or I guess it, it doesn't necessarily get mad, but there's, yeah, the row supplied does not match the height. Um, can you do something like this? Or no? Do we need to actually expand it out like this? You can only, can you only do that with uh, literals? Whoops, that's not that's not how that works, right? Um, like if you had this, you end up with the something, and if you times it by two, you end up with two of those. Can you do that? What does range actually return? Is I guess the question here. This is the part where you know the tricky part about this whole operation is probably coming up with the drawing routines to actually stick stuff into the image in the first place. And to a lesser degree, what you might actually do with the thing when it happens. Um, oops. Uh, 
Yeah, that doesn't help. So that's going to look like that. Hmm. I see. So it gets mad. Well, I mean, that's what I did up there, and it got angry about it, right? That's interesting. Probably don't need this outer list on it in that case, because it's just going to expand on its own. And this is totally OK with generators. Um, so let's try that. Whoa. Range object cannot be, in oh, because this thing is doing something funky with it. I'm not entirely sure what exactly, the, the internals of this iterating through this, one of the things that it mentions is that it tries to convert, oh, I guess we could go to the, It tries to convert as much as possible into stuff uh, for various different values. To do color, more color. Oh. This makes for scintillating viewing, doesn't it? Uh, use the iter yeah, see this says you, the list isn't necessary. You can usually just use the iterator directly. So uh, I guess that's using a slightly different thing, but I saw some other examples uh, when I was just sort of poking around earlier while I was eating dinner that seemed to point out the same thing is true. Um, so, the trick is to come up with the actual array that we want, I think. And maybe we need to have it expanded out first before we pass it to that thing. Because, like, this clearly does what we want. Um, maybe, again, we need to do that. Um, if you pass list around the whole thing, does that... Does creating a list out of it expand the generator? I guess it does, doesn't it? Um, so maybe we don't need that so much. Let's try some stuff to see what this might be happy with. Uh, what if this was the list? Nope. I'm having some severe issues. Um, how about this? Yeah, 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 I'm aware. Just just playing with some uh, sample ways to pull something like this off. Uh, there we go. Perhaps made that a little more complicated than it needed to be. So we totally have an image being blopped out over there, so that's cool. So let's uh, change all these to 64 just to make that a little bit smaller. And mostly black. Ooh. So that's an example of doing some stuff with grayscale. Now, um, something to try here um, would be this. So we'd say import IO, uh, and then we can say F is equal to IO dot byte.io, whoops, thus, um, 
then we don't need that line. Whoops, pardon me. We don't need that line. We still create the writer. We still create this. I'm a little unhappy that that is technically required, I guess. Um, we don't necessarily do that. Um, print, whoops, get value to get the buffer for this thing. Yeah, then close it, then what the heck. And we end up with a little bit of that. And uh, oh, wow, that actually ends up being a pretty tiny encoded thing, all things being told. We can see the PNG header, we can see the I header, we can see the end. This is really reminding me about how long it's been since I uh, looked into this sort of thing. Um, I just want to check this. Built in, can we uh, start, stop, step? So range 10 gives us uh, oh mm. a range from like so um, that's just the stop value so if we we would be able to say 0 9 1 to get the same thing right there yeah doesn't stops. So that still goes like yaw. So if this was 10 and this was 20, we still get the correct number of things. Um, so we could say 64, 128 on this thing. Um, let me just temporarily put this back to the way it was before. And we get a little bit more of a gray. Cool. So, say we don't actually want, say we want 32 and then 32 plus 64. Sort of get a little bit of gray in there. And uh, yeah, this is the sort of stuff that I fiddle around with behind the scenes. So, if you were following November last year in the dev log when I was creating the Sudoku game, before I got into that, I spent time with small sample plugins like this, just fiddling with what is the best way to get text into the screen and clear it and refresh it if something needs to change. Um, and also how to design the text so that I could have a custom color scheme that hides certain things and blends them with the background so you can't see them, but they're still visually distinct enough as far as the syntax of the file is concerned for the color scheme to be able to color them, which is how it managed to make some numbers green and some numbers red uh, because there's actually hidden characters or around on either side of them that tells it one way or the other, but those characters had a color scheme rule that hides them. This is, you know, the, uh, the process for coming up with cool stuff in Sublime, I guess one could say. So, that works just like so. And if we were to swap that back to this, then what we end up with is the value there. So now the, I guess the thing to check here is if we were to look in let's, let's open this one uh, just temporarily. So I think I had something in here. Is there? Oh. Hmm. This is some very simplistic uh, stuff here. So let's see. The whole of this whole thing, I'm guessing, is okay. That's getting a setting. That's just what the URI is supposed to look like. So 
assuming get file content gets the binary content of the data encoded as that. Um, let's just whoop that over to this one temporarily. Paste it in here. If we could generate a data URI out of one of these things, then we could preview them in a. I mean, technically, we could preview them in HTML anyway, but uh, part of the reason for wanting to do something like this is to be able to generate an image that doesn't have to reside on disk in order to be displayed. Um, ideas include that drawing graph paper on the screen, which is clearly something that is technically feasible to do. Uh, reminds me that it's been a long, long time since I worked on Bresenham's line algorithm to be able to draw lines and uh, that sort of thing. So what we need after this is some sort of blitting library and something that can convert an internal sheet into, we have a way to convert it to PNG, right? Um, so there's still a lot of utility for something like this. Uh, let's say that data is equal to f.getValue.decodeUTF8. We don't need that. And then we can go ahead and close it. And it is important here. Uh, I'm not super familiar with the way that these uh, the byte IO and the other stream stuff happens in Python because I very rarely do my own file IO. Uh, but what I do know is that this is creating a temporary stream that's being backed by uh, a byte buffer. Uh, and when you close it, the buffer goes away. So you need to capture the value before you do that or it gets real unhappy. Um, this is a test. Oops. How are you uh, enjoying your, your time in Sublime 4 and being able to try out all the new stuff, Ashwin? <laughs> That's interesting. What if I took that out? Hmm. If we were to look at the other window, Oh, it has to base 64 and code it. Derp. I think you can use a context manager instead. Uh, yeah, you can't. I, I didn't do that specifically here just because when the close happens, the buffer goes away and I want to make sure that it's uh, everything's kosher before I start screwing with it. Um, Import base 64. I forgot uh, an important bit here. <laughs> uh, Ashwin also says, ST4 is definitely awesome. The new UI is very refreshing along with other time-saving goodies. Yeah, it's, it is, uh, it's, it's exciting times. I'm, I'm both super excited for and vaguely dreading when this build drops because I'm going to be a busy bee. I have like a very long list of shorter um, video ideas for just quickly throwing out there, like, are you want? Do you want to use Sublime three and four? Here's how you modify that. Hey, have you noticed that the cursor isn't blinking? This is why. This is how you fix it. And just smaller little bits like that. Uh, it's going to be fun to do, but uh, it's going to be kind of overwhelming. I'm kind of have fingers crossed that it doesn't happen through December because I've got a lot of stuff going on there and that would be extra stuff, but I really can't wait for it to become more publicly available. What's going on over here? Boop. Oh. Someone's just liking a thing on the forum. Oh, okay. That is less interesting. And uh, can you see how much my face lights up when I look at the forum because of its, uh, its lighter in nature? Ah. Uh. What was I doing here? Um, 
we want to say data is equal to base 64.b64 in code. Uh, f dot get value dot decode btf8, which is clearly the default, but unexpected indent. Oh, whoops. All right, that's looking good. And if we had that, then the URI looks like this. And we could even do the fancy stuff like this, right? Oh, shoot. Mm. Mm. Image slash PNG definitely. Is this binary data? Yes, it's base64. We're always doing that. And then that would just be the data. We don't even need any of that bit, right? So there's our data image PNG. Assuming I guessed the, uh, the MIME type correctly for that. An idea would be like five minutes Monday kind of short videos explaining smaller subtle changes like cursor, Mariana, panel switcher, etc. Yeah. Uh, and part of this is also kicking the idea that I only ever post videos on YouTube, but I could potentially get more exposure if I posted stuff on like Instagram and I don't know, does Twitter have inline videos? I guess probably. Um, so, but those ones have to be really small videos. So this seems like a good way to just create small ones and throw them out there, but I'd want to have them on the channel too. So maybe do that throughout the week and then have a video that's on Monday that's like more smaller videos chunked together still only in the you know five to seven minute range but with a lot of smaller things because there's definitely a lot of small things in there that would you know assuming that it didn't have the introduction at the beginning and the 20 seconds uh, at the end that is always on there would be like a minute video you know explaining that yeah the, the default carrot style changed because you know power consumption you can swap it to the other thing if you want or yeah the default uh, color scheme changed so it is definitely an interesting time and as much as i'm not really interested in you know making a billion dollars for being a youtuber or anything like that because i really don't see that happening i don't really have the time to devote to something like that I do still want to try to do the best that I can with promoting the channel and getting content out there so that there's more viewers and I'm helping more people. And I think you can have short video GIF clips on Twitter. Yeah, I I think so. I It's been so long since I've done it. Way back uh, in the day, my November projects tended to be game-related. Um, like I made a, a clone of Dr. Mario in a web page one year. Actually got a takedown notice from Nintendo for that one. That's how you know you've made it as an indie game developer. If Nintendo threatens to sue you into oblivion if you don't take your hastily constructed, crappily made clone of a video game that they made 35 years ago off of the internet. Um, I did Bolo Ball uh, because uh, Keith uh, really liked that game. So I made a version of that in a browser as well. And whenever I, at the end of uh, a lot of November days, when the devlog went up on the blog, I'd also have animated GIFs in there too. But, oh man, that's got to be four or five years now. I'm imagining that you can have 1920 by 1080 streaming video in there or something at this point, the way technology changes. Um. So, we know at this point we're definitely getting a URI out. So, we can say, let's make this a little bit smarter. With io.bytes.io as, we'll call it handle. Well, I guess file is a good enough name. Bump that out like this. We're not going to need the close. We're not going to need that. We definitely, well, we'll put that up there, but... 
just to remind us of what we had going on in there. I don't like short names. That's just irritating. This is going to be file, like y'all. Yeah. And yeah, I forgot one. OK. Man, I seriously want to find time to get into Lua and love 2D and make some 2D RPG games, but time is really a short commodity. Yeah, Lua is great for that sort of thing. I've never actually used love 2D for Lua stuff in games because it there wasn't a compiled version for Linux, the Linux distribution that I use, uh, and I would have to compile so many libraries to get it up and running that I just sort of pass it by the wayside. But I have heard a lot of uh, great things about it. And I, I've used, I've created my own custom C++ game engine such as it is with Lua as the scripting thing so that you just need uh, native code to be able to generate the uh, the screen and then drop into Lua for everything else. And you technically don't even need to do that. You could Lua is so awesome for embedding in things. There's a lot of, oh, and I don't know if there's a, if you want to make 2D RPG games, there's something called RPG Maker. There's several of them. Uh, VX, Ace, Ace, MV. I think there's even a new one now. Uh, you can find them on sale on Steam pretty cheap. And they are sort of a dedicated tool for creating JRPG style RPG games, if that's the sort of thing that you're interested in. I want to say there's free stuff kind of like that on Steam too, but I haven't, it's been a while since I've looked into that sort of thing. But you know, writing game stuff is, uh, it's totally a fun, addictive little thing. I keep wanting to sort of spend some time on some ideas I've had for for games, but I got too much other stuff going on. As you say, time is a, a really short commodity a lot of the time. Pardon me, a lot of the time. Um, oh, pardon me for bumping the mic. This is why I think I mentioned in the Discord recently, I switch to using TypeScript for games because I wanted it to be able to I wanted to be able to write it on Linux but still play it and test it on my Windows laptop out there and writing cross platform code is a pain in the butt. But if you use a browser and you know JavaScript or TypeScript compiled to JavaScript you can get away with not doing a lot of that. You lose a lot of freedom that way. Uh, as compared to creating just something that creates its own window and does absolutely everything. Uh, but it's a real cool shortcut. And I think I even have on my GitHub page uh, all of the uh, code for those things. They're in various November projects and such. I should dig one of those out at some point. I think I even have RX, the, uh, the thing I got to take down uh, from Nintendo about in one of those things. Um, I got to take down because I was on itch.io to, to sort of as part of like a, I don't know, it was a game jam thing, but there was just a page. It was a, an easy way to be able to distribute it to people to package it up and give it away for free there. Uh, and Nintendo did a big sweep through and found various, uh, anything that looked even remotely like something that was based on something Nintendo did, they were quite unhappy about. Okay, so, oh, whoops. I don't have to do that. Show pop up. Sublime dot active window dot active view. Oh, say if view, then view dot show pop up. Learn your lesson about the not their sheets not having a view if they're not text related things. Uh, the content is going to be an image tag with. A source of oh, of URI, URI. Thank you. And uh, do we need any flags? Mm, yeah, we probably want sublime dot hide on mouse move away. 
and we'll leave the location at minus one. Don't care about any of that stuff. Let's see what happens when I save this. All right, so it's it's working, but um, well, for one thing, that's broken. Whoops. So there we go. <laughs> and actually, uh, this actually works a little better than uh, I recall, because I think you used to have to say this. Or maybe I'm thinking of phantoms. So with just this, we totally have the power to crank up a PNG without having to store it to disk first, which is cool. Um, and I guess what we could also do, if we didn't want to do that, actually, we should probably just do this, right? I personally find Lua very pleasing and easy. It has some concepts unique to it, like table being the only data structure, which is interesting. Yeah, I've uh, I've been a fan of Lua for a while, especially yeah. You can, it, it's so neat that you can use it as. <coughs> pardon me. I don't think I hit that button in time. You can use it as a list. You can use it as a dictionary. You can use it as both. You can use anything you like as a key. Um, you can create linked lists if you like. We have at work uh, a process where we need to talk to a data service to collect data in a little binary blob and then convert it into CSV data in a variety of different formats and write it to a file to give to a user. And we do that by using a custom Lua interpreter with a lot of our libraries bound to it directly so that we can work with stuff as if it was like native C code. And one of the awesome things about that is how easy it is to keep the data structured and have lookup tables that very easily allow you to find the associated value for things without having to, you know, if you were doing it in C, it would be like a big binary search operation to find the thing. It is a real pleasing uh, language to use, although I, I have not used Lua since I started using Sublime Text um, for no particular reason, really, except I think I, I sort of stopped all hobby coding on anything other than packages when I started using Sublime. Um, Something else we can do with this is to say, and the contents is HTML. We don't want it to be transient. We don't want to add it to selection. But what I am going to say is group equals two. We can close that one temporarily. Unfortunately, every time we do it, we end up with a new sheet. Maybe it should be transient, and then it would just get replaced every time. I never actually played with that. In that case, I think I could just do that. Yeah, that works pretty good. I used to follow the Lua mailing list very religiously uh, until I eventually had to stop because it seemed like there were just a lot of language lawyers in there or people that were trying to get the Lua developers to change the syntax in some fashion so that something would work for them out of the box so that they wouldn't have to modify their own version to do so. And one of the things I really love about Lua is the developers are very staunch in not necessarily guarding the code. It's open source in the sense that everyone has source to it, but they don't necessarily, it's like on GitHub in a read only kind of way. You can get it from there, but you 
I think you could technically provide patches, but they don't just like allow anybody to submit changes to modify the language because they want to keep it uh, controlled and for their particular purpose. And that is uh, really great for stability of a language and making sure that it, it does a few things, but it does them really well. And that is like exactly how Sublime works as well. Okay, so we have uh, this going on. Maybe we could uh, abstract this slightly more. Um, so let's write a let's write a function here. Display PNG. Let's say, um, and then we could say as pop up equals false, and otherwise it will be a view. Mm. Name, data as pop up like this. Um, so if as pop up, then it would be this. And this is another example of how uh, I like to get stuff working and then sort of tweak it into a position uh, because often I f you can find yourself trying to structure things in a way where things aren't working and then it's hard to see why. But if you know what, know what works, then it's easy enough to pull stuff out. Um. And we'll else that one. Otherwise, we're going to do it. Um, oh, sorry. These need to come up here too. Data is the base 64 encoded version of the data decoded to UTF-8, then the URI is that, then the HTML is that. So we don't need this part here or this part here. But what we do want is something like that. And then this would be name, that would be HTML. And this would be display PNG as ramp and file dot get value and as pop up is false so this should create the transient tab over there I suppose interesting now that that's transient I'm not entirely sure how you make that thing go away <laughs> so we're We're really uh, verifying some stuff here. All right, that's definitely working. <laughs> Is it necessary to provide a name if it's going to be transient? You're not going to be able to see it? Probably not, right? So let's go ahead and just bloop that part out. So let's go ahead and do that to make that part nicer. And we don't need this argument. Now oh, this part can go away. And let's say, whoa, that's weird. So every time we save the plugin, that happens over there. So now we can look at other examples of stuff we may want to play with here. Um, let's just do like this. Someone is asking in the Discord, is there any way to make build results uneditable? I'm assuming it is, just not sure where. Uh, it's a property of the output panel. And use set read only on the view. That might get in the way of the output, uh, uh, the output though. Doing two things. We are rocking it out here in the wild world of streams. Doop. Boop. Uh, and I got to close that because otherwise I lose access to all of the windows on this particular screen. 
Uh, oh, and we're getting a little bit of action there. Okay, so um, what were we looking at? We were looking at you. So the first thing we did was that. Actually, I guess we need one more. Um, we can close this one. We don't care about that one now. That's that's doing what we want. Um, def uh, ramp. Oh. Hmm. I'm thinking we <laughs> we want to blop all of this stuff out there, but maybe we don't. So let's just leave that alone for now. Well, yeah. Let's do this. So if this was ramp then it's presumably doing that. And if we do that thing we just did a second ago, we can see that changing. So that's cool. Uh, uh, yeah. So the next thing to try, that's a one row image. A uh, little message. A list of strings holds a graphic in ASCII format. We convert it to a list of integer lists, the required form of the write method, and write it out as a black and white PNG. Note how we use len s0, the length of the first row for the x argument, as the number of rows for the y argument. So let's. Is it possible to attach a click handler on the generated PNG images? Yes, it should entirely be. You would need to do something like a href equals something like that, and then wrap this. That would make it clickable, as we can see there, but nothing happens when you click it. Um, If it was in a pop up, I'm trying to remember the magic of the, how that works now. Because um, if we were using show, whoops, show pop up, one of the arguments is on navigate, right? Um, so just as a test, if I swapped. Yeah, this to be true when I save, whoops, true when I save, we get that. And I can still click it, but technically nothing happens. Um, but when we show the pop up, we can say on navigate equals lambda href and then print href oh, href it's real important for the debug code to be spelled properly right um, so if we do that and click it we see it happening down there in the console whenever this is clicked and the on navigate callback gets called with whatever the href is there. Um, that's the old way to do this. Uh, and this is actually what's used in the package pop up when you do package report or whoops. Well, that'll work. It's probably not the thing I meant to pick though. Yeah, I meant to pick, say, say that one. In all of these things, when you hover, we can see view differences or create override. These are actually links with custom hrefs. And when this pops up, the on navigate uh, uses that click to know what to do something with. There's a new way to do this. Um, ah. Hang on a second. I'll unblind us in a moment. <laughs> Um, 
Oh, it's probably not even in here, isn't it? It's probably in mini HTML. Protocols. In HTML sheets, pop-ups, annotations, and complete item details, the href attribute of a tags automatically supports three protocols. HTTP for standard URL, HTTPS for standard URL to open browsers, subl, a command name, and args to invoke like a command. So uh, there's a way to, for pop-ups and annotations, it's possible to do that. So you can't do this in a sheet, but you can do it in a pop-up, but this will also work in a pop-up if we want to. So what we could do um, is hop over here and say, instead of that, this would be subl colon echo, let's say. And then we don't need to have this on navigate at all anymore. That would just be gone. And when we click, we see the echo command triggering down there. When I click, that's interesting. I don't know that I would necessarily expect that to happen. <laughs> I would imagine it should ignore what's under it if there's a pop-up, right? But we can see that happening there. Um, we could actually encode some arguments in this, which is where it starts to get kind of tricky. And there is a... There's a command that does that, but I can't I can't remember offhand what it is. Let's see if it's in here. In code, no. Uh, oh, I'm in the. There we go. Not that one. Mm. A command string encoded via format command. Yeah, this thing. Where'd it go? Oh, it's right there. Create command string from stir, command name, and optional dict of args. And this is in the sublime, yeah. Sublime.format command. So this could actually be, we did this. Sublime.format command, and the command we want is the echo command, let's say, and the args are click true, like this. And then when the pop up happens, uh oh, hmm. I may, oh, I may have, oh, that's. That's a tricky bean, isn't it? Let's do it this way. <laughs> Better? Worse? Um, oh, did I break it in some other fashion? Hmm. Did I do something obviously wrong here? Oh, there you go. Sublime.format command. You totally, uh, you probably popped that in the chat while I was looking to find the thing, right? I don't think I have that in here yet. Yeah. Which is kind of surprising. But I've been sort of uh, waiting for this new the new stuff that will popped in there. Why is it unhappy about this? I've never really played with that myself. Let's clear this thing. <laughs> Is it not the href that you uh, would put that inside of? Because that really doesn't seem like it's doing the right thing. <laughs> Oh, actually, it's encoding the command, but it doesn't have the uh, the thing on it. So I probably needed to say this. Does that make it happier? No. 
Hmm. Have you ever uh, played with this bit, Ashwin? <laughs> Turn that back on. Oh, I need command URL for it. Whoops. Ah, I looked at the wrong one. Shoot. That'll do her. CMD. That is uh, what we want here. I was just going to say, it seems like this has got to be quoted separately. What the heck, man? But, uh, yeah. There we go. So, yeah, you can totally do that. <laughs> If, uh, if that is the sort of thing that you'd like to do. So let's leave that open for the time being. The next thing is this one. Let's play with this. Um, we'll give it a name in a second. And this would be... Uh, Copy the stub down here. And uh, nope, cut, cut that part out and replace it to here. We don't need that. Don't need that. We just need a simple call to file and S. And then display it. Let's see what it does. I suppose, um, call the thing. <laughs> hey, check that out. It's a PNG. It is being drastically scaled up from its native size because of what I did to this. If this part wasn't in here. That is a very, very tiny bit of text. I'm not sure that that, prob that even uh, necessarily shows up in here. Uh, but that would explain why. It, uh, it looks like this, and it doesn't have the correct aspect ratio as a result. Is there a way to use only one of these and not the other to get it to keep the correct aspect ratio? Mm, not that way. <laughs> Well, by mm. so we're we have the ability to do that too. And that works. Um, so we'll call this PNG text because that's what that's doing. And it's created to color by using a PNG file with a palette. Um, which is not necessarily what you want. We want to actually get this going with c colors other than grayscale. So this one has a little bit of extra stuff in it. We can actually sort of see what that's doing. So let's copy this and paste it down as PNG color text, for example. And that would be there. So technically that's doing the same thing. That's probably the exact same text. Now that I now that I see that, I can totally see the P and and G in there. Um, and we want these couple of lines in here too, just to see those are the same, right? So yeah, what we need this time is a palette. And I'm guessing uh, because this is storing the value zero or one, that's what sets colors to be on or not. So now we're specifying what the values of those two things are. So black is probably some sort of grayish color based on how it's the same three things there. Um, and instead of saying grayscale equals true, we say, whoops. Palette equals palette, and we end up with orangey, pinky type text. Huh. Right on. For color inputs, for color images, the input rows are generally three times as long because there's three channels or potentially four if you wanted to have the other thing. So we can see the, the idea for... Um, 
if you wanted to use this to actually write images out or use them, you'd want to have something that allows you to draw on a surface and then shoot it through this to actually convert it to PNG. Um, and the two don't necessarily have to be related to each other. Um, and this is something that I actually did you know, hysterically enough in Lua at some point. I have uh, a project I called Lua Web that was a CGI interpreter with a ton of custom C libraries built in for being able to decode form URIs, upload files, do various stuff so that all of my web scripting, my CGI scripting can be done in Lua. And one of the things I did was bind libpng to it and create primitive drawing routines and blitting routines that had, it would allocate a block of memory that represents the image and you could draw into said image and then a call would pass it through libpng to convert it into uh, data which presumably I was streaming directly out of the script if you wanted to generate a PNG on the fly from a, a thing like that um, and something like that is very possible here as too uh, and Ashwin asks can one combine this with drag select to make some sort of sublime canvas I don't think so in the general sense because drag select only triggers for inside of a text file. So if we turn log command logging on, let's spell it correctly. We can see it happening here, but it doesn't trigger in here at all. The only interaction you can do in something like this is that so I don't see an easy way to generate some sort of drawing thing like this in theory um, and yeah there was I'm I'm showing my age times two here because way back when I was in high school or junior high, in the days of the 8088 or 8086, you know, before we started calling them 286 and 386 and 486 and Pentium and so on, there was just the PC because there was only the one and dial-up modems made squelchy sounds and transmitted stuff around at 2400 baud if you were lucky the instead of there being an internet there was bulletin board systems where you would dial into a phone number and there'd be like a program that could send ANSI escape sequences over to your end and you could go on forums sorts of things and make messages and download and share files and then you'd have to hang up so that somebody else could dial in and get said message it was a pioneering time. Anyway, way back then, there was this piece of software, and I cannot remember the life of me, which is the other reason why I'm super old, that just gave you an 80 by 25 text screen. And you could move the cursor all around in it and say, I want this character to be here. I want this character to be here. I want this character to be blue. I want it to be black. I want it to be whatever. And as you moved the cursor around and entered colors, it was actually recording that you moved the cursor one to the right, one to the right, one line down, draw this, or the cursor skipped from here, move the cursor to here, draw these three lines as characters as blue. And you could actually make little text animation, ANSI animations and have them play out. You could do something like that if you had a file that had a certain number of lines that were filled with spaces, you could use drag select to drag through the thing and you'd be able to see where the selection was and then draw characters in those by replacing content and the buffer as you went through, um, which would definitely work. I kind of have plans to do that with HyperHelp uh, for box drawing. I want to be able to you know, drag and say, this is a line, this is a line would be a hell of a strain on the undo system though. 
because every time you modify something, it would have to add something to the undo buffer. Let's turn that off. Um, I think what we'd like to do is something similar to that, but maybe with alpha values. Let us play a little bit with this. Uh, let's call this alpha ramp. And let's go ahead and change both of those back to 256, 0 to 255, right? Um, 255, and that would be 256, and then false, and then alpha ramp. Um, whoa, what would I do? Oh, that should be, yeah. So it's back to that, but we're constraining its size artificially. So let's go back and swap this up. Um, so we got that going. Now, if we could figure out a way to convert this into the sort of thing that we expect it to be, we could have transparency on this bad boy too. So the first thing we need to figure is how to cut, turn a range into four values. Do we want four values? Yes all the way transparent to all the way opaque, right? Yeah. Is there a cool way to do that? Range five, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, actually you don't even need to do that. Can you just wrap it and it automatically generates? No, all right. What we need is for this to end up being 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2. How would we do that? If we can do it for a short range, then we can do it for any range we like, right? That's a nice short one. That's an even shorter one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's what I thought. Um, that would do it for one. Um, but if you wanted to do it for like that, you end up with the, the wrong uh, thing there. I imagine there's got to be a really ele elegant Pythonic way to pull something like this off. But I'm not entirely sure what it would be. We're into the emergency second coffee now. Um. Oops. So, okay, that would do it for one thing, but we want to do it for like a range of say, say three things. We want to pull that off. We want to zip them together. We had something like that. Um, Zero, one, something along the lines of this. Um, oh, I guess this probably needs to be look like this, right? Not valid, huh?
What if I did this? X for X in. So that would totally work. So I guess something like <clears throat> why am I even doing it that way? That does not make a lot of sense. We just want X, 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 X. Right? We want something like that, but we want those arrays to be coalesced into one. But presumably this does not work if you have multiple things. I wonder if, will it accept that? I'm going to assume no, but give her a try. Um, the thing we need to do here is say grayscale is equal to false. We save it as we have it now. It expected way more things than it actually got. Right. Um, Yeah, that's what I thought. Again, this really seems like something that is probably a very simple thing to pull off. Um, X dot append Y. Yeah. So we X dot update Y. No. Uh, to Google we go. Python. What we what are we even trying to say here? This is clearly one of those, what's the syntax to insert one list into another list? It says, oh, extend. Extend is the thing. I thought that might be it. X is that. Y is that. X dot extend Y. That is what we want. Uh, I, I had a thought that that was the thing, but I've been doing so much JavaScript and TypeScript lately that I had it in my head that I was remembering that incorrectly because uh, that's not entirely the... That's just kind of the same thing. Ba -ba -ba. So one thing we could do is this. Um, How hackney is that? Can't extend byte array with int? Oh. What? <laughs> It's unhappy with the stuff that's happening directly <laughs> directly inside of the PNG library. Um, so that's a different thing. Let's go ahead and comment both of those things out. And let's say one. OK, that seems OK. That seems okay. Okay, that really seems like the thing that it's supposed to be doing. Hmm. 
Hmm. Oh, I see. We don't want that. Okay. We definitely don't want to screw with that. But this needs to look like that now. Um, previously it was a generator, and now it's not. I would have thought. Oh, um. Uh, that really? Mm. Now was expected 768, but it got 1,024. Did I miss an important bit here? Oh, uh, we probably need more action here. Boop, boop, boo. do reading okay so let's take a look at the code for this thing to see what it is that it's actually doing bit depth specifies the bit depth uh do, do, do png only store so if we want the alpha argument oh we need to provide uh, alpha equals true here too there's where we went wrong And we are totally seeing uh, that that going through there. We can actually modify this. If we set this to 255, then we end up with the result that we had previously. If we set this to zero, the whole thing is transparent. We don't see it at all. And if we set to 128, it's got 0.5 opacity. if we were forcing the whole thing to have it, but we're having the opacity be zero here and then ramping up. So maybe we actually want 255 minus X for this operation. And then we trail off to opacity on the right hand side on this thing. And if this was actually generating to a file, we'd be able to see that happening too. Um, so let's try that. I totally blomped out that, f that file name, didn't I? I did. Sublime.packages path slash PNG test slash alpha.png write binary comma this way um, turn that off we maybe see uh, uh, that did I oh 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 <laughs> there's the file and if we came down here and open up that, there is the alpha that we can <laughs> we're uh, seeing there. So we can see it. It starts off with none and graduates its way out. Although how visible that is in the stream remains to be seen. But we could, if we put this back to X when we do it, we can see. It's completely transparent here and then fades in over to that side. So on the right hand side where it's white, it's fully opaque. And if we were to set this to zero here, you see full transparency, 128. We can see it uh, going there, let's say 200. Now we can actually see the colors and there's uh, an even alpha across the whole operation. So we have a lot of power with this particular thing. 
Um, so the next step for something like this would be actual drawing primitives, which isn't something that can happen tonight. But this is a pretty, pretty handy library. And as we saw, ridiculously easy to inline directly in your package. Um, I just curl downloaded this thing. And uh, this is, oops, this is me clicking the wrong thing. I am. Uh, Pi PNG. I actually found it somewhere else and clicked here to come to the code because of the thing that I saw where it said, you can, here's all of the code for a bunch of stuff. And there's probably a lot of, uh, I don't know what all of the stuff in here is per se, but one of the things in here is PNG.py, which is the actual code, um, which is the, uh, the thing that I curl downloaded to actually get this thing. And the last was last updated 15 days ago. So imagine you're not the only one doing this. If you have this embedded in your own package and you just do a very simple, you know, from dot PNG import the things you need, you're guaranteed that you're not going to run into some weird action where somebody else is got the same version of the, a different version of the library that maybe has different arguments or interprets them in a different way or is slightly broken in some fashion, uh, which would be uh, very sad indeed. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to do here, and I probably should have done this way back when, I'm going to throw this into the chat as well. So if anybody has followed along and gets this far, this is the code for this particular thing. Um, and the documentation should be linked from inside of here. Here's the uh, link to the documentation, which is how I got to uh, this page here, which is not dark. Uh, you'll see it as light colored. I just happen to be using this dark reader uh, thing on all of these pages to make this darker and uh, nicer for our eyes. Particularly old man eyes. Uh, note that we can create PNGs directly from arrays if we want to, to, to do stuff out. You should probably, you know, like look in the actual documentation here, but there's a, there's a couple of classes in here. It shows you how to write a PNG, how to read it in if you wanted to manipulate it and do something and write it out again. And um, I guess this is just sort of the, uh, the whole list of how this thing actually works. So sequences of rows, byte arrays, you can see, uh, this is the stuff that I sort of looked at before the stream actually started to get an idea for how this works. Um, but there's um, this image class, which is essentially what happens if you load a PNG, you get this and then you can you know, this particular one, you shouldn't actually do something with, although it doesn't say that in the code, I don't think. But you can save it to disk or write it to an already open file, read uh, a PNG in to be able to modify it, and then, as we saw, be able to write it out. Um, you can, oh, look at that. You can even do stuff like expand it out to various things. I, know, I checked that it does... Um, various bit depth so you can use palletized images with this which we didn't fiddle what well, we did play with that briefly here you can do grayscale you can do full rgba with blending um and so this is really i think a pretty pretty powerful for what it is i mean theoretically the png is uh kind of sort of simple enough that for some things you don't necessarily even need a library you, mostly the uh barrier to entry is being able to gzip things and python has a zip library built in so you can get a lot of um, action out of that too this may use excessive memory do not uh, pull that off so certainly for something this big do we want to be stashing this in memory mm. uh, but imagine we wanted to play a little game of D, D inside of sublime we could have our split window um, where this is drawn as a grid and over here is something that you're interacting with with key bindings. This view is read only. You press keys. It outputs some more text like Zork back in the day. And in reaction to what you do, it generates a new PNG and automatically on the fly it dumps it out here without having to create any file on disk said package will work on Windows, Linux, or Mac OS with no 
external anything required. Everything is self-contained inside of your one package. Pretty cool stuff. I think the only thing that I'm missing from this, and I'm not entirely sure if it's possible, is to be able to determine how big a view area could potentially be so that you could know how to size something like this. Because all of the display things are in dip, device independent pixels, and I don't think there's a way to correlate that per se. Maybe there is, now that I'm thinking of it. And this is just sort of us going, mm, thank you, going off the rails here slightly because it, it is almost uh, time for the stream to be done here. Um, font size, is font size defined in points? or pixels or what is an interesting thing to think if i look at font size over here if i spelled it correctly my font size is 13 so it's 13 everywhere um That says 23, um, but line height is probably going to have some leading and trailing on it and not necessarily the whole height because there's extra line padding. Um, default pref set. Additional spacing at the top of each line in pixels and bottom of each line in pixels. So you would have to take this into account. But if there was a way to sort of determine based on the line height, you can see how many lines fit inside of this thing. If you could convert that into some pixels, you could figure out dynamically how big a view uh, to actually create so that you can scale your drawing as appropriate, which I think is... The potential issue there if you were to just draw things as two pixels wide someone with a AK monitor is probably not going to be able to make that thing out at all um, but if you made it really fat someone with a like a 1920 by 1080 like this you know it might be seem extra bold so there's a little bit of scale that needs to happen there but I think you probably have to play with that in a setting I'm not entirely sure um, but this has been a, it's been a fun little uh, experiment in fiddling around with this and being able to display PNGs without putting them on disk, without any native code, I think that's pretty cool. And I think that is where we're going to call it. we got about five minutes till the end. We're not really going to pull anything too exciting off on this one, I don't think. So um, that's going to be all that we have for the stream tonight. Now, remember, if you are not a subscriber to the other channel, um, you won't know that I put a video out there that points out that all through the month of December, I'm going to do two live streams a week minimum, um, again, pending health issues, because if something comes up and I can't go on, I this is not, I know, I don't want to force myself if I get, you know, sick or something. But uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays at the regular time, um, watch Twitter, subscribe to this channel to know when I'm going live. And depending on workload throughout December, potentially some other ad hoc streams might spring in. In that case, you're probably going to want to follow me on Twitter at OdatNerd um, to make sure that you know when a stream comes. Otherwise, you'll just get a notification that I'm live directly. If you want a little bit of advance notice, I can provide it on, on uh, Twitter. And we're going to be working on the YouTube package that uh, you saw me working on a stream or two ago where we were working on being able to inject table of contents by extracting stuff out of a Camtasia file. I have plans for that package, things I've wanted to do with it, uh, being able to ship changes back up to um, YouTube so that you can modify things, templates to be able to put uh, boilerplate text in because I like to keep a, a certain format to how the descriptions of videos go, uh, swapping uh, thumbnails, uh, for example. <clears throat> so there's stuff that I'd like to do with that 
And we're going to spend live streams doing that all through December here on this channel. And then I'll also be doing other work on a daily basis. So if you follow this channel, you'll get to see live streams and you'll get to see daily videos that are going to appear here on this channel because they don't want to overwhelm the other one with 31 consecutive days of videos. There are people out there that like Sublime, but they're not necessarily interested in a guy making a YouTube plugin for this. So this is more of a targeted thing. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, on the other channel, all through December is going to be plug-in 101 videos exclusively. Possibly also Sublime 4 videos appearing on the channel if it's publicly announced uh, in there. And then uh, back to regular videos on uh, the start of the new year, whenever the first Monday is. Because I only have the, the things planned out for the remainder of this calendar year. Um, so with uh, all that said, uh, thanks so much for watching. If you have been, remember to... Uh, Use the buttons down below, thumb subscribe and share and uh, follow the other channel link in the description if you want to see tutorials and other videos. Uh, but until the next live stream on this channel or the next video on the other channel, this is Odat Nerd asking you to please have a sublime day. Ending stream. I'm never going to be good at doing this. Never.